Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Wisconsin Veterans Museum's latest installment of Curator Conversations today. Uh, today we're going to be looking at Playing War, the Evolution of Military Toys in American Childhood. Uh, but before we get started on that though, I just want to thank the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation uh, for their continued support in this free programming. Uh, they do a fantastic job in supporting all the programs we, we do, not just the Curator Conversations, but also the trivia nights that we have. Um, the movie discussions uh, and all of our other virtual programming that we are putting online to include our upcoming cemetery tours. Uh, every year the Wisconsin Veterans Museum hosts the uh, Talking Spirits uh, Forest Hill Cemetery Tours. Uh, this year we have to do that virtually, uh, but we've put together a really great tour for everybody. We've included a lot of stuff that we haven't been able to include in past tours, and that will be uh, coming out on October 15th on its own platform and you'll be able to access that whenever you like. So look forward to that information coming out very soon. Uh, we're excited to roll that out and we hope everybody uh, participates in that. Uh, it should be a great program this year. Um, so thank you again to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation and their executive director, Ms. Jennifer Carlson, for their continued support and all this free programming that we get to do, I would say here at the museum, but we're not here at the museum, at least not yet. Hopefully soon though. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today. Uh, first, Mr. Gregory Lawson, who is our gift shop manager, uh, and Mr. Michael Olson, who wears a couple different hats at the museum. He works with me in the education department, and then he also works with Mr. Lawson down at the gift shop. Uh, and they, like I said, are going to be talking about um, the evolution of military toys in American childhood today. Uh, gentlemen, I uh, will turn the platform over to you. Oh, but before I do, uh, if I could just remind everybody, if you do have any questions, please submit them through the chat function. Um, I will get all the questions together as the program goes through, and then we'll address the questions uh, in the last 15 minutes or so um, of the presentation. Uh, so if you could just use the chat function to submit your questions, that would be fantastic. Uh, and Greg, Mike, the floor is all yours. Okay. Um, first off, just like to welcome everybody in, say thank you for spending some time with us for about an hour and uh, having an informal discussion about military toys and how it affects childhood, um, really in the United States and around the world. Um, I've been with the museum for about 10 years as the gift shop manager started in 2010 and um, so I'm kind of excited to do this and kind of talk with you a little bit. Yep, me too. Um, so this is... Um, Gonna be fun. We're gonna start in the late 19th century, although military toys go back um, far further than that. But we're gonna start with the little, the little lead, the little metal army men that everyone kind of kind of knows from the Victorian era. Yeah, one of the one of the constants that um, while doing the research for this particular talk um, that you know, that I noticed in particular in dealing with the idea of childhood play was the idea of children consistently using um, military toys as a way to make sense of the world around them. It's a way for them to understand adult ideas and adult situations, current events, what's going on in their home lives, what's going, around, going on in the country, what's going on around the world. And even though the toys change from tin soldiers to plastic to G.I. Joe to video games today, the basic motivations are the same. And then also a common, uh, common thread that I discovered is that depending on the type of toy that's being used, it's also seen as a subliminal kind of military recruitment tool where the lead figures of the late 19th century in Britain, for instance, um, documented that as prices came down via through production and uh, cost reductions, you started to see more children in the um, working classes see the military, particularly the new standing militaries of the 1800s, as a way for social advancement. Um, so military service moved away from a noble pursuit towards something that anyone could do. Um, I found that to be incredibly interesting when we were doing the research. I think one of the things I found really interesting doing the research was, um, 
I know Greg had found this as well during his, um, is that Winston Churchill, um, famous British statesman um, leader of Britain during World War II, um, was very fond of playing with his little military miniatures or little toy soldiers. Um, and he, he played with them often. And because his father did not think he had quite had the academic aptitude to go on to a traditional upper class, you know, Oxbridge, Oxford, or Cambridge, that was part of the reason that he ended up at Sandhurst, um, Britain's version of West Point. And getting into the idea of the 10 figures in European history, because that's will be the basis for this. Uh, Kenneth Brown of the Queen's University of Belfast wrote a great article titled Modeling for War. And in it, he looks at the motive, he looks at the effects of 19th century tin lead figures on, um, on children during that period, but then also leading up into 1914 and seeing how there's a correlation between the play of tin, of leaden figures, and then also Britain's recruitment efforts during World War I in the early years. And it's a very interesting article, highly recommend it. But what he found was that by the end of the 1800s, many tin figures are prevalent in British households. Um, Germany and France were the earliest producers of these figures, mainly for the nobility in Europe. Uh, going back to the 13th century, German figures were found in Magdeburg, and in 16th century in Northumberland, a bill of sale was found for 4,000 of these leaden figures. By the 19th century, military figures are more available to everybody, mainly due to cheaper production materials and production methods, and public awareness of professional armies in Europe at the time, which became standing armies after the Napoleonic era. Uh, in Britain, the Prior to uh, William Britton, the figures were primarily made of wood and tended not to be popular and expensive due because they were being shipped from Germany from the continent. Um, by 1893, William Britton, who um, we know today is a major manufacturer of military uh, figures, they changed the way things could be produced in England. And they produced the first hollow metal figure, which mimicked a wax doll head in production. It brought production prices down, but more importantly, it brought shipping costs down as well. So since everything was being made in Britain, these toys could now be more readily available to children in England and in the English area. I, I think um, another thing too, Greg, besides um, W. Britain finding a less expensive way to manufacture these that's interesting is this is about the time when um, retail in America and Europe is undergoing a significant transformation. So you have the rise of the department store in Paris and London and here in America with Macy's in New York and Marshall Field in Chicago. And this is another way to, these businesses instead of being, which most shopping in the past have been mom and mom and pop general stores. Um, now these companies were able to buy, buy, buy things in quantity, buy things in bulk and offer them at, at much less expensive prices. And this is also around the same time too, with um, the railroad going in, you know, as the railroad network continues to grow across the United States, that um, Sears and Roebuck comes out with their, their first catalog, excuse me, in uh, 1897. So that's about the same time too, when we're talking about, because W. Britain's hollow casting is 1893. So all these, all these factors kind of converge to um, really bring little metal soldiers to the masses for the first time in, in both Europe and America. And as Michael points out, one of the deals that Britain strikes up that really helps their distribution of their product is that they deal with um, the British company Gannages, and which is one of the larger, at the time, department stores in England. Um, they're able to develop their numbers to the point that by 1910, they're producing and shipping 200,000 figures a week out of a North London factory. And this, this uh, production and sales for so many companies said, you know, they wanted to be part of this. So this is where you start seeing companies like BMC, Waterloo Toy Company, George Wood, they all start to produce um, metal figures just like W. Britain here. By 1914, nearly 11 million figures were being sold in Britain a year. And it's quite astounding. 
And as Mike said, many businesses tried to cash in on this trend to the point that these figures were even found in optometrist offices. Um, so what we have here is that these figures start to illustrate the beginning of the leisure recreation trend in Britain at the time, but also advertising helps to promote these figures. As Mike says that you have catalogs like Sears and Roebuck in this country, W. Britain was working with um, children's comics so that they were taking advertisements out in the children's comics and children's books for their metal soldiers. So no matter where the children went to, they were finding that W. Britain was there selling their products to them. I think that's fascinating that, that, the, that comics, the tie-in with comics is a um, way to market the, the soldiers to children it goes all the way back to the uh, turn of the end of the 19th, turn of the 20th century, because as, as, you, as you, I'm sure you found out as well, when we get to post-World War II America, especially when you get into the 50s, 60s, kind of the, what I think is considered the golden, correct me if I'm wrong, golden age of comic books, that's really when they start, these toy companies start figuring out that, um, hey, we should really, this is a great way to market, market our toys. And then you take a look at, even during World War II, for instance, Captain America, Marvel Comics, uh, Namor the Submariner, Batman and Superman are well-established characters by World War II, but Captain America comes to prominence because he's participating in World War II. So it's another way to get the kids out there and get the kids behind Marvel Comics and then whatever is in the Marvel Comics at the time. Uh, one of the last things that's interesting about the William Britton series is the kids weren't the only ones who saw the importance of these military figures. Um, even British military commands saw their benefits, particularly after seeing how the Prussian armies of the late 19th century used military miniatures to help their war gaming in something that they called Kriegspiel. And what it allowed them to do, it allowed them to create better visuals of troops moving across terrain and to the point where this was actually taught at Camberley Staff College. Gate Wargaming becomes so popular during this time that H.G. Wells and Robert Louis Stevenson even write rule books for wargaming so people can do it properly. Yeah, there was, on, on that note, there was a great um, little anecdote I found in one of the articles on JSTOR um, where uh, about this time period, I believe, um, at r really upper class British gentlemen at Parliament, one of them goes into one of them's, another one's office and on the floor, you know, they're sitting there in their several row suits on the floor of the office playing with their little, with their little W Britons. And this was, you know, it, it, it was uncommon enough to be kind of funny, but it wasn't, it wasn't, like you said, it wasn't crazy out of the question. And that's how popular they were. And we know W Britain today it's no longer uh, headquartered in England. I mean, it's, in, it's headquartered now in Ohio. Um, we actually carried W. Britons here in the museum store for several years, and they were quite popular with the um, people that we had visiting the museum, particularly during the sesquicentennial. Um, like most things though, W. Britton toys, or W. Britton miniatures, due to price point, due to various other factors, while they produce a very high quality product, it moved away from being something that kids could readily take and play with and become more collector pieces as, as Michael shows here with the slide of the Union Iron Brigade number one. So they go from being pieces that in the early 1900s would have been a dollar a piece to now you're looking at $40 a piece. So it's much harder to create a set. One of the things though that's very interesting is the idea of socialization and the interaction with children and instruction is through the way that they play with the toys, their children are able to become more of a creator. They're able to interpret the life and their uh, current events around them so they can see and play with these figures and they could reenact battles that they might have read about. They could reenact battles that were occurring in the newspaper as a way to not necessarily understand exactly what was going on, but understand in their viewpoint what they could make of it and take from the conflict, which I found incredibly interesting. 
as we were doing research. Yeah, I, I did as well. I thought, um, you know, there's the, the argument, especially going back to like, you know, the height of the Vietnam War in the late 60s about whether war toys, whether they're good or bad for children. And I mean, that's what gone on through the 90s, whether violent video games, war video games are, are good or bad for children. But that's something I'd never considered before that, you know, children used uh, little, tin, little tin soldiers or their little green army men or whatever. They used them as ways to, like you said, to kind of control and to play out, to deal with. I mean, almost like it's today there's a whole, you know, there's a whole school of psychology play therapy where, you know, like art therapy, where this is how, this is a way for children to process these difficult emotions or whatever. Maybe they're, you know, their father finally coming home after being away at war for years or one of their uncles getting, you know, injured really badly. This is a way for them to, this is a way for them to process that. I I'd, I'd never thought of that perspective before. And it's interesting that like the Washington Post, for instance, during World War II, children here in the United States were really interested about American involvement in World War II. But since we were far removed by two oceans from direct fighting, everything that children heard about World War II were either in newsreels, newspapers, or else conversations from their parents, family, or friends. They didn't have that direct firsthand knowledge when it came to actual fighting. So they had to find a way to make sense of that to themselves. And even various publications during the early 1940s made mention of this to where the Washington Post ran a story where they said, play is the language of children, their way of working out the matters that concern them deeply at the moment. And also Parents Magazine, encourage parents to view kind of militarized play as children finding a way to release their tensions and fears about what were what was going on in the world at the time. So this play, even though we would call it highly militarized, was really an outlet for the child to understand, which is very important. Yeah, and the, I thought it was interesting too that the main criticism I found and after, after the Vietnam era from scholars regarding war toys was um, towards not so much that war toys existed per se, but the fact that now they, the story was already all created for them. It was all, the play was linear. They, the children lost their ability to create and use their imaginations. With the, when the 1980s comes along, there is a change in the law making it, um, Toy manufacturers, such as the big ones, Hasbro, Mattel, for the first time, they're able to um, market toys on, t on television to children, directly to children, where in the past, traditionally, toys had been marketed to the parents because they were the ones who had the money to buy them. But now they're starting to be marketed to children. And what do children like? Children like, that's where we get back to the comic books and we get into the, they start having cartoons made, developed for them. And these two, these scholars argue that um, yeah, it's it, it's taking away the it's it, it, it it's taking away the uh, the spontaneity. It's taking away the, uh, the unstructured play part of it, and that's that's really the redeeming value that people see in war play. And then, really, what changes? And then we see the evolution of the military toys, and this gets into Brian your question a little bit. The lead figures that we see prior to World War II, you're right, they are posed quite a bit. And it's more of an attention pose rather than an action pose, what we would consider to be something where you might actually line them up and fight a battle. Um, one of the first instances in my research when I was looking through this where you see more of the action is actually during World War II when you start seeing the adoption of the plastic figures. Now they had action poses for lead, but you start really seeing it during World War II where you have the six, the, you have the traditional little green army soldiers introduced with their six, po with their six poses of bazooka, mortar, riflemen, prone riflemen, and so forth. Um, so you start seeing that the military figures, because they're cheaper to produce, you can buy a hundred of them, then they start being more interactive rather than they're all on parade or they're line, 
they could be lined up in a particular battle. You can start moving them around and actually having something more of like a set piece battle with them. Um, where it really gets interesting is, again, getting into the child psychology of it, is talks about um, the idea of the little green plastic soldiers being very um, generic and nondescript. They could be anybody. They could be a father who might have come back from World War II. They could have been a brother who participated. They could be anything from a private to a general. So depending on the need of the, the creative need of the child and the imagination, the child could take the same soldier, reenact a World War II, World War I battle, but then the same green army soldier could look at Vietnam, Korea, Civil War if need be. They could go back to the Punic Wars if, if they had to in a pinch. So it's that level of creativity and imagination that using the little green army soldiers that I think really, really comes out in the post-World War II era with children. One of, my, one of my favorite things I found was um, there is a museum dedicated to the history of toys and video games in upstate New York called the Strong Museum of Play. And they have the um, World um, Toy Hall of Fame and the World Video Game Hall of Fame and Little Green Army Men, G.I. Joe, are, are both members. But one of the things they pointed out in the little description for Little Green Army Men was the inexpensiveness and thus the pervasiveness of these that completely, like Greg said, it changed. Not only were they they could be anything. They were so, you know, indescript, but they were so inexpensive that kids could start playing with them in a completely different way. It wasn't a big, you know, if, if you lost one or if you lost a handful, you know, sh shooting a whatever, your cap your cap gun or whatever, fireworks by it, it wasn't that big a deal. Whereas in, in the past, you know, losing a little metal soldier, for most people, you know, that's a, it's going to totally, totally change the way kids play it. Now, where I, where I get really interested in it with is with the adoption of G.I. Joe. Um, I was born in 1978, and so the G.I. Joe second series for me was very influential in how I grew up and what I played with. Um, I collected many of the G.I. Joe figures, had a lot of the vehicles, and to the point where you know, I had quite the army on both sides. And it was neat for me to be able to go to various stores, like um, in when I was living in Wisconsin, it was Shopco, Prangy Way in Eau Claire. And then when I was in Virginia, we could go to Toys R Us and we could go to KB Toys or G.I. Joe, like the W. Britain figures, they're even sold in, um, drugstores like Revco or Walgreens during the time. And the neat thing about the G.I. Joe figures to me were that they were cheap. And in about 1989, you could go to Shopco or Prangy Way, and with $10, you could buy three different G.I. Joes. And you could take them home. They, they would be open by the time we even got them into the car but then you could play with them right away and you could take their poses, but then automatically right after taking them out, they started to become the object of play. So they could either have their intention of being a military figure or else we could wrestle with them or else play football against um, like my He-Man figures, for instance. So it really was only captured, um, limited by my scope of, ima of, of imagination. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the beginnings of G.I. Joe? Sure. So, yeah, the beginnings of G.I. Joe. So, we've kind of moved on from Plastic Soldiers. 19, here, let me pull up the slide. I believe it's 1959. Hasbro, so there's, there's two main toy companies in the world today that started off in America. Hasbro, out of uh, Rhode Island, uh, the Hassenfeld brothers, two immigrants from Europe, came over, eventually... Um, it's still a family-owned business. I believe it was up until at least 10 years ago. And then on the West Coast, you had Mattel. And Mattel came out in 1959 with, with the first Barbie doll. Now, this was immediately very, very popular with little girls, not so much with little boys. So Hasbro, on the other, con or other side of the continent, decided to 
they said, what if we could make a Barbie doll, but for boys? But one of the big pushbacks from all the people they bounced the idea off of, their, their uh, account executives, toy buyers was, oh, little boys aren't going to play with a doll. They don't, don't want to play with a doll. Boys don't want to do that. So they, um, in a shrewd move of marketing, they decided to not call G.I. Joe a doll. G.I. Joe is an action figure. And as an action figure, that was one of his main selling points, um, was the fact that he had, that you could pose him, that you could put him, he had different points. Let me pull up the slide here with the original G.I. Joe. The original G.I. Joe comes out uh, five years later, 1964. And he comes out in four versions, one for the army. There's a action soldier, action sailor, action, action marine, and action pilot. Um, and he's posable. I believe he has 12 points of articulation. Uh, now, 19. 19? 19 points. Okay, 19 points. Yep, so, so here's the very first G.I. Joe. $3, I believe. Sold be between $3 and $4 in 1964, which is you know, it's, it's quite a bit of money. But one of the things that parents um, liked about it was apparently they were made very, very high quality from even from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The body, the body parts, um, everything except the head was made in Rhode Island. It was made up in their, their headquarters, Hasbro's headquarters is in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The heads they had made in Asia. And when they put them together, it was a, it was a solid, you could tell it was well built. And the clothes and all the accessories that went along with it, all the little weapons and the tents and the, and the army and the gear for all the branches. It was, it was, it, they made sure it was exacting copies of, of the real thing. Uh, they actually got blueprints from um, different armories and would bring them back to Hasbro and make exacting little copies. So parents knew right away that this was a high quality toy. So it was, it was worth the three, four dollars to them. And this is, G.I. Joe is basically Hasbro's answer to Barbie's, to Mattel's Barbie. And the idea behind these is the razor, what's in marketing called the razor razor blade uh, theory. So what they want you to do is they're going to sell you the doll, right? Doll or action figure inexpensively, but then they're going to make their money as over, over time, over the years, you have to buy, you keep buying new sets for them. They, they came with, you know, dozens and dozens, hundreds of different sets of little equipment and stuff and, and things. And for Barbie, which would be, you know, little outfits. So that's where they were going to make their money. It was the, it was called the, the Gillette principle. Um, and let me see if here, I have another slide. And what's interesting about what Michael was saying about the accessories is that by the end of 1964, G.I. Joe sales and accessory sales accounted for two thirds of Hasbro's profits for that fiscal year. So that's how, with something being introduced in 1964 or 62, by 1964, it's an integral part of the Hasbro business model. Yeah, and before G.I. Joe, um, Hasbro's main, largest product, which was Mr. Potato Head, and we used to come without potato. You had to supply your own uh, vegetable to put the uh, glasses and different things on. Um, so this was a huge risk for Hasbro when they decided to bring this out because they, while they were still a large company, they were nowhere near the behemoth they would become in the post, you know, by the 60s and 70s. And here's an image of the original four Joes. Um, which are highly collectible today. Apparently there's been over 500 different G.I. Joe individual figures, which is uh, pretty incredible um, considering they, they haven't been sold continuously since 1964. Basically, so from 1964 to 69, as you see on the slide, um, was the original run. And then there was a run in the 70s when they become action team members, when the war toys are no longer because of everyone's, you know, the unpopularity of Vietnam, they decided to market them as adventurers, almost like Indiana Jones type figures. They go on adventures and discover treasure and, um, you know, ha have, have to find artifacts or have to find like ancient artifacts. Then again, in the, in, in the 80s, the ones Greg talked about playing with as a child. And then there's been a few attempts in the late 90s to, to bring them back, but that hasn't really... They never really took. Um, 
one so, of the oh, things, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say over 500 characters basically in those three little chunks of time in the past 50 years, that's incredible. Yes, but one of the things that helped G.I. Joe really become an outlet for children's play were the innovations that they had for the G.I. Joe soldier themselves, um, where primarily dolls had a firm one piece hand, G.I. Joe now had the grip to where they could hold a weapon, they could hold a rope and rappel down the side of a building. They became more interactive. And then by 1984, you had the swivel arm that was introduced to the three and three quarter figure. Um, if you remember, the series one actually didn't have the swivel arm. The, the only joint was in the elbow in the 19, the series one. But by series two, they have the swivel arm. So now the, the arm can not only move up and down, but it can also move side to side. So it creates a whole new level of interactive play for children. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that, as Mike said, G.I. Joe originally in the 60s, it faced a lot of challenges from Vietnam War. Um, it just became unpopular. So G.I. Joe goes through its, through its 40 years, it goes through about four or five very significant rebrandings to make it more appealing and to keep it um, available on the toy shelf so people pick it up and don't associate it with the war that's going on in Southeast Asia at the time. And that's where I think setting it up as the adventure series of G.I. Joe is, is very interesting. But also by 1970, they're given lifelike hair and, and a beard and such. So it really, it really starts to take on its own identity. Um, in dealing with the three and, a, three and three quarter figures, we see that that's impacted by the 73 OPEC embargo. And so Hasbro, in a way, had to cut, had to find a way to produce the figures in a cheaper manner. And so due to rising oil prices and production costs, they went to more of what they called a, um, they just reduced the amount of petroleum that went into the products. And it ended up create, creating a much less durable product by the end of the 70s. Meaning that G.I. Joe, as you were playing with him, he went from being a rugged figure, something you could throw and really play hard with, to something where if you picked it up, his leg might fall off or his arm might fall off. So the quality went down. And as a result, the sales of G.I. Joe initially in the 70s went down as well, to the point where they had to introduce enemies for G.I. Joe called the intruders, which were super intelligent cavemen from space. But this eventually would set the groundwork for their enemy that we most associate with G.I. Joe today, and that's Cobra. Let's talk about the slide I have here with the um, toy machine gun. I, now, this, this fascinated me, the Mattel Burp Gun. Um, so the Mickey Mouse Show is, is one of the first uh, programs aimed directly at, um, new television programs aimed directly at children um, in the late 50s or mid to late 50s. This was advertised during the Mickey Mouse Show. Now, you go not only, not just, you know, roughly 10 years later, you go from this, something that, this is just shows the kind of environment that G.I. Joe was originally born into, to this Lego piece ad where other companies, other toy companies were del deliberately marketing their toys as not being military, having nothing to do with the military or with war. And I found that fascinating. Um, there is no way the, and, and apparently this was a very, very popular toy. It, uh, President Eisenhower at the time apparently had trouble getting a, um, a few of these for his grandsons. And it's just, it's incredible to think that within 10 years, you know, how much the uh, climate around toys had changed in America. Um, I'd like to actually address a comment that was put out by Christopher um, about other kinds of um, equipment and playing war. And I think that's a, that's a great question. And one of the best things that I found with it that really speaks to your question is there's an article that I came across in research called Grenades in Toyland. And it looked to be, to deal with the idea of 
play for kids during World War II, prior to baby boomers, but kind of along in the same lines to where it looked at how parents should address military play, but also the kinds of military play that children were, off, were apt to engage in during the 1940s, early 1950s. And the article talks about everything from children's books taking on a military theme. You started having um, kids who might have been in the Civil Air Service, um, adventures about them. Um, dealing with children who might have been on a coastal coastal area and how the war would have impacted them. So they were com they were getting influenced through literary means. But then also magazines like um, Popular Mechanics were giving out diagrams on how to make military toys like Jeeps, anti-aircraft guns, other kinds of fortifications from cardboard. So that as metal was going towards being used in the, um, the war productions, kids at home could still find a way to interact and play, a long, play in, with uh, military style toys. Good housekeeping actually gave diagrams for creating rubber soldiers at home. Um, you also have a rise in military uniforms being sold and targeted towards children. And then as you said too, board games. Um, board games start to see, you start seeing a lot of kids playing with board games like Risk. Um, again, Popular Mechanics came out with several different games that were targeted towards um, children playing with a military, military style board game as well. Um, the, the farthest that I went up with that this goes up is to about the late forties, but that's probably the closest that I came in my research to what your question was referring to. Um, yeah, in, in reference to that, um, I know Greg said that he played with the, uh, the eighties GI Joes. I think I did too, as a kid, I was born in 83. Um, but I like to play war, but I, I, this was back during the era when you could still find army Navy surplus stores in your town. So I, I, my toy of choice, I guess, was, were, were Lego, Lego blocks. But when I played war, which I love to do, I would, I would get the little fatigues and I would actually get the stuff, the old gear from the army Navy surplus store and act it out that way. And two, this was, I mean, my grandparents' generation were, you know, this is the greatest generation, the ones that were just in the tail end of the second world war. So I really looked up to them. And um, personally, that's how I related to war play as, as a kid. And then I guess I found in my research too that I can't find it in my G.I. Joe book right now, but um, G.I. Joe became popular, when it became really popular in the 60s, um, they decided to license the brand out to different items. You know, just like you would think of um, popular children's thing today, right? You got lunch boxes, you have, you have Disney characters on candy at the grocery store. They, G.I. Joe in the 60s made um, child size replicas of, of all these items. So kids could actually play, play war themselves, get dressed up in little toy soldiers, which, or as, as, as toy pretend soldiers, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and that went along too with their uh, G.I. Joe club. You could um, join a club where you would, um, for a nominal fee, you would, you would get a certificate in the mail saying you were a member, you would get a little custom dog tag and you would get a newsletter telling you, you know, every, every so often about different G.I. Joe club members, what they were doing either with their, um, with their Joes themselves or what they were, other little boys were doing playing war with the, with the boy size equipment. So that's what I found in regard to that. And that even continues into the 80s to where um, certain figures were only available through special mail order. Like you couldn't purchase individuals, individual figures like uh, the first series one Cobra Commander, he had to be sent away for um, using flag points, uh, what Hasbro considered flag points. And Hasbro originally figured that they were only going to have to shell out 5,000 Cobra Commanders, but the 80s G.I. Joe line became so popular that they actually had a request for 125,000. So they had something, they knew they had something on their hands when in the first year they did $1 million worth of business. By the second year, Series 2, they, it had moved to $100 million a year in G.I. Joe. But then as quickly as it starts, G.I. Joe in the 1980s pretty much 
it starts to flounder after about five or six years. And what you have is that one of the major challenges for the 80s G.I. Joe came from one of the major inspirations of the 1980s G.I. Joe, and that was the 70s Kenner Star Wars figures. And what ended up happening was that Hasbro needed something to go against the three and three quarter Kenner figure. Well, as G.I. Joe took off, Kenner started to run into financial problems and eventually they were bought out by Hasbro. And so you, most of your Star Wars toys today are produced by Hasbro. As G.I. Joe began to wane, Hasbro started to move their focus towards the Kenner, the Star Wars line. And by the early, by 19, the mid 1990s, you started, you stopped seeing G.I. Joe as a product on toy shelves in various toy stores. Um, but G.I. Yeah. Joe in itself, go ahead, Mike, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I was just gonna say, I, I thought it was interesting too that, so Greg touched on earlier how in the mid 70s, G.I. Joe gets a more, he gets a muscular torso, and this is a way for um, Hasbro to reduce the cost of manufacture, less plastic is being used, and this of course relates directly to the world economic situation, OPEC and the oil embargo, um, plastic, is, the, the plastic made in these toys, or used for these toys anyways, is made from oil. So that had a direct impact on, on the cost to the company. Um, it also costs a lot more as the cost of living goes up through the 70s into the 80s. It costs a lot more, obviously, I never thought of this, to make all of, I don't have any slides of it, but to make all the accessories that go along with G.I. Joe, right? When you're making, when you're making Jeeps that fit G.I. Joe, it costs a lot less in materials to make one for a three and three quarters inch Joe than it does for a 12 inch Joe. Or when you're making, you know, like a, a little base, it costs a lot less to make, to make one scaled down to fit a three and three quarter size Joe than it does the 12 inch Joe. So that, that's another reason that besides the popularity of the Star Wars Kenner figures that Joe shrinks down in size. And another thing with G.I. Joe too is, especially in the 1980s, is we, st we see the individualization of the figures themselves. Um, one of the ways that Hasbro was going to market G.I. Joe was through the creation of um, making sure that each one had their own unique identity. So your G.I. Joe figure went from a generic Navy figure to Shipwreck, who is... Um, who is a navy is a uh, navy soldier and a sailor, and he is uh, the navy re the naval representative on the GI Joe team. This was done mainly through contact with Marvel Comics, where writer Larry Hama created the backstories for all the characters in GI Joe and Cobra as well. But what really influenced GI Joe was the creation of the. 30 minute cartoon. And so what you see is G.I. Joe originally was going with the comic book and then due to FCC regulations, they had to limit commercials to seven seconds. That was the most they could put on TV to sell the children. But in, by 1984, you start seeing that those FCC regulations are relaxed to the point where they're able to have a half hour cartoon. And getting to Mike's points about, comment, about production, any kind of vehicle or figure had to be animated, had to be easily animated. So you went from figures and vehicles that had a lot of detail on them to more generic figures, more box figures because of the animation process. But because animation took over and they, the cartoon was so popular, many children ended up just running to the stores as the figures became available. Let's circle back around real quick uh, before we jump into video games here with the rest of our time to, um, so I talked about how Mattel had um, Barbie and Hasbro had G.I. Joe. So through the years, they've tried at different times to introduce, I'm gonna show you here, Hasbro in its third year introduces a female character. Now, apparently this did not sell very well. It, it bombed for them. But they did try and what these companies have spent countless hours and millions of dollars studying the way little boys and little girls play and what they found out is that 
in general, they just play completely differently. So even the little girls back in the 60s that were given the G.I. Joe soldier or sailor marine, what they would do is they would, you know, essentially more or less play, a lot of them would play house with them. They would, you know, put them to sleep in their little cot or they would, you know, get the, get the inside of their bunker all set up really nice. So what I'm trying to say is the companies have tried to cross over and, and have some appeal to the opposite gender of, of what they're usually, um, usually did, but it's just, it, for, for both companies, it, it did not, the market just did not uh, bear it out. I also have, um, so then in the, also in the late 80s, uh, Mattel does something, makes a couple of service Barbies, and a, a service Ken. Um, show you real quick. So again, they've, so apparently Barbie's had over 200, 200 careers, 200 different occupations in her long career. And this, this was one of them, Barbie's in the army. These were um, the Stars and Stripes collection was for about four years. And this one is actually on display in our museum and our galleries. Um, it just, it just didn't work for some reason, you know, ha having girl soldiers and having boy, um, what, what do I want to say? Boy, you know, I would say probably engendered playtime. Right, right. I mean, like crossing over, crossing over genders just did, did not work from a financial standpoint from these companies. And I think that would be the main reason that neither one, you would, you would not see, see those things um, today. Well, but in, in response to recent um, requests for more gender equality, um, what happened in October of last year is a schoolgirl from Little Rock, Arkansas named Vivian Lord, she wrote to BMC, which is still one of the larger producers of plastic little green army men out there. And BMC had previous requests for female representation in the little green army men. And finally BMC said the Vivian Lord said you know where's my representation where where are the toys that I can play with and BMC finally heard them and so later this year early next year you're going to start seeing the uh, female green army soldiers that are available to play with with the rest of your uh, green soldiers which is I think is actually really cool I think it's a it's it's a really neat thing to see and um, hopefully it opens up a whole new avenue. Um, do you think we have time to get into video games? Oh uh, yeah, we can touch on video games, I think, real quick. Yeah. So, so video games, um, in about the mid to late 70s are when video games start coming from arcades or arcades, bars, you know, where the first video game systems like, or arcade machines like Pong were located. The first attempts at making a home console um, come about. Magnavox makes one. The Odyssey, they don't sell very many of them. And then Atari makes its first home system, the 2600. And video games, at first, in the early years, the graphics are very primitive, especially compared to what we're used to today. Um, I have a slide here that shows what a 2600 game looked like. This game was Commando from 1988. And... If we had an Atari, then you're probably most familiar, too, with the game Combat, where you could be the plane, a biplane, and a tank, if I remember correctly. So we go from this, um, the change in, in, in technology, the rapid rise in technology and quality is, is incredible, just over a, a few short years. So here's the Nintendo Entertainment System, which far more, it's a more successful on the market, far more people have what a video game looks like in this generation. When we go forward, Wolfenstein 3D. This is a computer game actually, but here you can see it's heavily pixelated, right? This isn't, no, they aren't using polyons yet to make three-dimensional characters, but as you can see, I mean, the graphics, it starts each generation as we go forward in time, it gets just a little more realistic, a little more realistic. And then Doom, Doom is the first time you can play these type of games called first-person shooters, where like Wolfenstein 3D, 
you're not a little character like Mario running across the screen, a little, you know, half inch size character. You are, it's the first person view. You are the character. You're seeing things through your eyes. That's why in the gun, you can kind of see the gun sticking out of the bottom there. And you would go through these, um, you would go through the, the castle in this case, and you would go through a, a, a base, um, a base in space, I believe, for um, for Doom. And you would go around and you would um, shoot the enemy this way. But Doom is the first time that you can play multiplayer games online. So no longer are video games, no longer to play video games with your friends. Do you have to invite them over after school and sit down in your living room or? you know, ha have a sleepover. Now you can, with your parents' permission, or these are targeted towards a little bit older kids, you know, you dial up the internet on your computer and you're able to play friends over the internet. But also getting into where, I, for example, I have an 11 year old son, getting into where children who, when I was 11 year old, was, who would have been playing with action figures, now you have Fortnite, you have something where children can create parties, customize their characters, and then they become the first person, they become third person interacting with the environment and other kids from around the world. And they're able to exhibit their creativity through customization of their particular character. Yeah, just a, just a few more steps here in, in video games. So the franchise, the last few years for first person shooter games that, um, gamers out there are familiar with is um, a series called Call of Duty. There's been Call of Duty games set in different historical eras, set in the World War II era. There's going to be one set, um, some of them have been set in con contemporary times, some are going to be set, um, or have been set in the future. There's going to be one, a Vietnam one coming out eventually. But before that, you had Medal of Honor. Now Medal of Honor, if you notice on the bottom, this is the game package, was um, created by designed by DreamWorks Interactive. Now, DreamWorks Interactive, for those of you that are into movies know, was Steven Spielberg's company. And this is around the, the same time that Saving Private Ryan came out. This is the first time this generation of video game systems, by the time you get to the next generation after the Super Nintendo and Genesis, when you get into the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn, you get into these here around year 2000, they're finally able to use polygons in, in building the characters. So 3D is becoming a reality and games are getting much more realistic, as you can see here. Call of Duty, and here's, here's, the, here's the package for, it's not the latest Call of Duty, it's the one from a couple of years ago, which was set in World War II. And this is, oops. And going back to my earlier slide, I'll pull up here in a second, shows just how far the graphics have advanced. It's, it really is incredible. What's Which obviously, go ahead. sorry, go, go ahead, Greg. What's interesting with these games, they rely upon the World War II era for their playable content. Um, Mark Salter, who, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Mark Salter talks about that in a paper that talks about geographical information and wargaming. And it comes down to an idea of World War II being one of the last ambiguous periods, where non-ambiguous periods, where you knew who the good side was and you knew who the enemy was and how easy it was to translate that to playable scenarios in wargaming. So when they introduce something on Vietnam, they introduce something on World War II, they're not as popular as the world, or I'm sorry, World War One. They're not as popular as the World War Two series. Yep, and so and here's a screenshot from the Call of Duty World War Two game that came out uh, just a couple of years ago. I mean, the realism is is truly incredible. This is screenshot is just a, a snapshot of in-game play, and again, it's first-person shooter where you are an American soldier and you have, and your job is to survive in Europe. And video games really take over from action figures. It really starts in the early 80s, but by the time you get to the late 80s, early 90s, just about the time that G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, um, dies off, that's when video games really eclipse, video games and electronic entertainment really eclipse um, traditional toys, action figures for, um, 
eight to you know six to six to ten year olds as far as play goes. Gentlemen, you guys put in a ton of research on that. Um, I learned more about toys in the last uh, hour than I probably thought I ever would. Um, we have a couple questions out there uh, before we wrap this up today. Um, you were talking earlier about uh, the origins of the tin figures, um, particularly in Britain. Um, but there was one of our participants who wants to know if there was any sort of big movement toward medieval or ancient um, warfare figures that were popular with kids um, that you guys came across in your research? Uh, actually, the article that I, re I referenced by Kenneth Brown, um, he does take a look at that. It is brief. It's, it's not a lot of description. It's, uh, he, he mentions it that because of price and because of availability in England, for instance, you have more of lead figures, tin figures being toys for the nobility, the people who could afford them. And they could contract to have them made because these were specialty items that had to be shipped over primarily from France and Germany. So they tended to be more expensive than the um, lower classes could afford to give to their children. If the children of the lower classes had anything, they usually made it themselves out of wood or any other kind of material that they had around. But if it was a well-formed, actual formed figure, it came from the continent. I think too, this is the time um, right around, you know, the 1890s, 1880s through the, up to World War I is, you know, right in the heart of the uh, imperial age, right? So everyone, your country is almost, you know, like, like, like your favorite team and it's a big deal. You follow, the historians have said you followed in the newspapers, you followed, you know, how your, how your country was doing and it's, and it's different colonies across the world. And this ties back to Greg saying that these little tin soldiers were a way to socialize little British children into, you know, playing into this, um, playing into this nationalism and, th and this imperialism that's going on that, you know, th this is exciting. You want to be a part of this as a kid and you're not, that's, that, that's much more popular at the time than, than thinking about medieval medieval times um getting to a comment in the chat eric sorry to cut you off there no go ahead but, uh brian your last your most recent comment in there you're right um he lost a ton of money from the projection of it one of the articles that i read is that he was offered three buyouts for gi joe in 1962 he was um an individual named weston stan weston yeah, went to Hasbro, and Hasbro offered him three things. They offered him $50,000, $100,000 to walk away, or 1% of all profits going forward. And he, he obviously, he had no idea what he had on his hands at the time. Nobody did. Nobody expected that G.I. Joe was going to turn into what it did. Um, so he took the $100,000 buyout and walked away. But if he would have taken the 1%, he could be sitting on at probably at least $10 million by now. Yeah, actually, actually the, I just watched that. Episode. You're right, Brian. That's a, that is a great series. The one on G.I. Joe um, interviews his son. Um, Stan Weston himself just passed away in the last couple of years. Interview his son, and his son estimates conservatively that if he would have taken the 1%, that would have netted his father at least 30 to $40 million. Yes compared to that $100,000, which he Because got. he would have tied into movie rights. He would have tied into all of the merchandise, merchandise that were not even associated with the um, toys themselves. He would have tied into all of that. Uh, yeah, he would, have been, he would have done very well for himself. But, you know, you don't, you don't see them take that much. They take the $100,000 if it's given to them right away, and then they, they just take off and go. And then another thing with Stan Weston. Um, so Stan Weston, this was originally his... His brainchild, he brings it to Hasbro and Dan Levine. Stan Weston throughout the years has considered himself the father of G.I. Joe. Dan Levine is the, or the, is the one who puts together the concept, builds out the toy line. He considers himself the father of G.I. Joe. So not only did Stan Weston lose out on millions of dollars, he, he is, he'd always felt throughout his life that he'd lost out on the credit of actually being the father of G.I. Joe, the, the, the creator. And then getting to another of the comments um, from John, 
you know, playing with figures like this, they're fantastic. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk, like I, when I came, when I grew up, I had the little green army soldiers, but I played mostly with the three, three quarter GI Joes. And for me, it was great, but it was also great to play with the fr play with friends. And if you went over to a friend's house, you saw that they had like the USS flag. You saw that they had the terror drone, the mobile command center. You knew like, it became like a, a status thing among friends, but at the same time, it was a socialization thing among friends as well. Um, I remember when I was in third grade, one of my coolest dioramas I did, I took my Lincoln logs and I took my little green army men and I did a diorama of the Alamo. And even though that's 30 years ago, I remember it like it was yesterday because it was just a really cool project to do. And I couldn't have done it without my little green army soldiers. Well, I thought uh, John's comment, too, about how he um, and his brother had their Civil War battle sets uh, that came. And, and I do remember some of these, but his seems a little more uh, intricate than the ones that I recall. Uh, they had toy horses. He says cannons, caissons, barricades, and it even came with the Southern Mansion. Um, did you guys ever play with those uh, when you were growing up, or did you come across some of those in your research? I never, I never saw the Southern Mansion. I do remember the horses and the cannons and things like that, uh, the little pickets that you could put up. Um, in the article about the late Victorian Edwardian uh, modeling, where it talks a lot about the development of W. Britain, as prices came down for sets, um, you started to see more more sets being sold like instead of individual figures one or two you started to have five to ten soldier sets being sold so it became more commonplace for these sets to be handed out and then as plastic is um developed in the 40s you it's easy to put a hundred soldiers in a bucket and you can just take and go and that's not very expensive at all either when it came to the actual developed sets, I, I personally didn't have one, no. No, I, I didn't either. From what I saw in the, in the post-World War II era, up until Star Wars becomes a cultural phenomenon in the late 70s, is the two other major play themes for boys um, were Wild West, like cowboys, mm -hmm. playing cowboys and Indians, or space. Um, space, which th there, were, there was space, there were astronaut G.I. Joes. Right. And that makes sense in the context of you have the, the space race with the Soviets going on in the Cold War and man walking on the moon. So, no, I, I did not see any Civil War ones personally. Well, guys, you did a great job today. Thanks for uh, educating us on uh, the history of toys uh, in American childhood, uh, military toys in particular. Uh, and I just want to thank everybody for coming out today, too. Uh, we do appreciate your presence uh, in all of our curator conversations. Uh, look forward to our next curator conversations, which will start to happen in October, uh, as we're at the end of September here. Um, and uh, October is going to uh, feature more of our archival um, staff as November, or I'm sorry, October is um, National Archival Month. So we're going to start looking at uh, family uh, histories and how to research those and other different topics related to uh, around that sort of um, uh, research tool. So please look forward to those and join us uh, for that. And also don't forget about the other programs that we have coming up. Um, and you can find all of those on our West website, uh, wisvetsmuseum.com. Um, once again, thanks to uh, Gregory Lawson and Michael Olson uh, for all their research and all their uh, great work that they did in putting this presentation together. And we look forward to seeing everybody uh, in a couple weeks.